really want to first and foremost um, welcome Mr. Hilton Himmerman um, on your right over there and to thank the Shalom Institute for making this available. Please give the Shalom Institute a big round of applause. I was lucky to be sitting next to Mr. Haney on one side and Renan on the other side last night um, with members of our board at Mariah College and 450 members of the community at a very special event called the Graph Oration, which hopefully you guys will go to when you finish school. And essentially the Graph Oration brings out incredible speakers every single year to discuss very, you know, to, to discuss very important topics to the Jewish people. And what they said last night was that the guest speaker was in a very unique position because we never have had the opportunity when Israel is going through such a difficult time to have someone that is literally a world-class political commentator, someone with deep philosophical understanding, with a truly Jewish heart and soul, truly Zionist heart and soul, and you can sense that in his incredible writing, in his beautiful oratory, and all the relationships that he builds. And ultimately, I guess this all comes together. And what I was so impressed by last night is the amazing, amazing complexity and nuance um, that, you know, that Yossi is able to harbor in the same heart. When we talk about people like Rav Cook, when we talk about people like Rav Soloveitchik, and some of the founders um, of modern orthodoxy and Zionism, religious Zionism that we talk of, one of the most difficult things to educate is the nuance and the complexity. And yet, Yossi Klein Alevi is, is able to bring this both in one. So the one. On the one hand, feel the difficulty of what we need to be doing in Israel, and feel how painful that, that is, but recognize the fact that we need to do it until we can get to a new place. So, we've got a very special privilege with only school that are, uh, that are having this privilege, and you guys are very lucky. I ask you to listen attentively, and appreciate what we're doing. The book Like Dreamers that um, Yossi recently wrote, um, which has really won prizes, encapsulates this me message of complexity where he goes into different characters and he's able to see through their eyes and through their brain completely contradictory views and somehow look at the harmony or the lack thereof that has resulted in today's um, conflict both within internally as well and externally with our neighbours. So, um, we really want to thank um, Yossi Kana Levy for taking the time to be with us, with us this morning. Hopefully, um, when we come on IST, a lot of the students will get to maybe see you in Israel. And um, without further ado, please give a big round of applause for Yossi Kana Levy. Well, thanks very much, and uh, good morning. I, um, I live in Jerusalem. I was born in New York. And I'd like to tell you something about why I moved from New York to, to Israel. How many, how many of you guys have already been to Israel? Wow. <laughs> All right. So um, it's a very special uh, Jewish community here. I don't know if, uh, if you realize just how special a Jewish community it is. Because if you would ask uh, almost anywhere else in the diaspora, a similar group, a similar age group uh, of Jewish students. How many of you have been to Israel? The, the numbers would be very, very small. Uh, so uh, you guys are really growing up in, a, um, in an extraordinary Jewish community that is deeply attached to Israel and the Jewish people. And as an Israeli, I just really appreciate that. And it's, it's great to be here with you guys. Now, the first time that I visited Israel, uh, I was 14, and it was the summer of 1967. Does anybody know why 1967 was a significant moment in Israel's history? <laughs> Six-day war. That's also something that if you would ask a similar age group of, say, American Jews today, they would not, most of them would not know that. So don't take your knowledge and your connection for granted. It's, it's very precious. So in the summer of 67, uh, I, um, I got on a plane with my father. Uh, my father was a Holocaust survivor from Hungary. And how many of you come from families uh, with Holocaust survivors? So my father was from Hungary. And he had two brothers who had survived the war who were living in Israel. My father went to the United States. Uh, 
after the war. And he hadn't seen them since the war. And in those years, it was very rare, actually, to just get on a plane and travel anywhere, let alone to Israel. But as soon as the war ended, and there was this tremendous sense of relief that Israel had not only survived, but really triumphed, uh, my father said, we're going on the plane, and we're flying to Israel. And Israel in the summer of 1967 was in this kind of euphoria. Israel had just defeated three Arab armies in six days. And there had been this sense of deep fear throughout the diaspora and in Israel as well that, God forbid, there would be another Holocaust, that this time the Arab armies would actually prevail and destroy Israel. Israel knows years had very narrow borders. And when Israel won its, its extraordinary victory, uh, Jews around the world were really in a state of, uh, of euphoria. And the fact that we had learned how to defend ourselves so well, uh, barely 20 years after the end of the Shoah, uh, was really seen by many Jews as a, as a kind of miracle. And Israel was, a, was really floating on air that summer. Israelis just couldn't believe that they had actually won this, this amazing victory. The whole world couldn't believe it. And I, had, I met my Israeli cousins, and I decided I wanted to be like them. I didn't want to be an American Jew anymore. I wanted to be an Israeli. And I decided at that moment that I was going to, to, to stay. And I told my father, he could go home, and I'm going to stay here, which seemed to be a perfectly reasonable decision at the age of 14. And uh, my father said, you're not staying. I said, I am staying. He won. And it took me uh, a relatively long time before I managed to come back to Israel as an immigrant. It was 1982. I was almost 30. And there were intervening issues, family issues, other issues that had come up that had kept me from realizing this dream of moving to Israel sooner. And why I moved to Israel, I would say there were a few reasons. First of all was the feeling that I had already then, in the summer of 67, at age 14, that I wanted to be at the heart of Jewish history. I didn't want to be a spectator, or the way that I would have put it then, in a very negative way, I didn't want to be a fan sitting in the stadium and applauding the Israeli team on, on, on the field. I wanted, to be part of, I wanted to be part of the team, part of that team that was really actively uh, forming the next stage of Jewish history. And I think that in the end, the only reason that makes sense for a diaspora Jew to leave a Western, prosperous, safe country and move to what is, after all, the Middle East. It's not only the state of Israel, you're moving to the Middle is because I realized that I couldn't keep away anymore. I moved to Israel because I had to know what was happening there from the inside. I really needed to, to in a way, to normalize my relationship with Israel. Not to have Israel be this thing that was kind of hanging over me all the time, but just to be my life, part of my normal life. And maybe in the end, the, the real reason, the final reason, that I moved to Israel is simply because it was possible. That Jews had been dreaming of this moment for, for 2,000 years. And suddenly, in our time, it was now relatively easy. It's not to say that, that, that it is um, without difficulty. Any immigration experience is difficult. And even the relatively easy experience of moving from a Western country to Israel uh, has its, its sometimes profound psychological difficulties, economic dislocation. But the fact that it was possible, it was simply possible to become an Israeli, for me meant that, that I, I needed to take that, uh, that opportunity and join my, my life with, with Israel's. 
Now, what I learned in the, I moved in the summer of 1982. The summer of 1982 was the beginning of what we call in Israel the first Lebanon War. That was when Israel invaded Lebanon to stop rocket fire falling on, on the north of the Galileo. And if that sounds a little bit familiar from uh, the news uh, today, that's because we have been in this pattern one way or another for many years of terrorists firing rockets at our population centers and Israel having to put a stop to it. And it was a very, very difficult moment in Israel's history. It was in many ways the opposite of the summer of 67. The summer of 67 was this, this expansive, heroic, uh, happy ending, at least we thought in those, in those days, that it was the happy ending of Jewish history. We won, the wars are over, and Israelis really believed that in the summer of 67. In the summer of 1982, we realized that not only are the wars not over, but they're likely to continue for a long time to come. And what was most painful for me as a new immigrant in coming to Israel in the summer of 67, in the summer of, of 1982, was to see how divided Israeli society was. In the summer of 67, Israelis were united in this sense of victory and, and euphoria. In the summer of 1982, Israeli society was deeply divided between left and right. The left believed that we should not be invading Lebanon, and there were many civilian casualties in that war. That was our first war of, uh, of that nature, fighting terrorists who were embedded in, in a civilian population. And when you try to fight terrorists who are surrounded by civilians, there will inevitably be awful TV scenes and awful, awful incidents that happen. And Israel was getting tremendous criticism around the world. And the people on the right who said we should go all the way, we should invade Beirut and simply destroy the terrorists. Very much, very much in a way that the kind of uh, discussions are just happening literally today in Israel. Should we go all the way? Should we destroy Hamas? Should we restrain ourselves? And what I realized very early on, and, and you know, when I talk about Israel being divided, it wasn't just arguments. People were literally shouting at each other on the streets. You know, right-wingers were calling left-wingers traitors. Left-wingers were shouting at right-wingers that you're disgracing the Jewish people. It was a very, very bitter time. And here I am, you know, off the plane. Guys, hi, I'm here, I've joined you, you know. And, and it was this moment of, of, of Israel, I'd say, losing its, its sense of the glory that we had in 1967. And so I realized very early on that I had joined a different Israel a much more painful Israel, uh, in some ways a much more real Israel. And my decision very early on was in order for me to become an Israeli, to really become part of this society, I needed to understand all the different pieces, the different parts of Israel. I needed to understand the religious and the secular. I needed to understand the Arab Israelis, and the Jewish Israelis. What does it mean to be an Arab citizen of Israel? Not an easy identity. What does it mean to hold a position on the left? What does it mean to hold a position on the right? And so, in a way, you know, in Israel, the term, the, the language that we use for new immigrants is that they become absorbed into Israeli society. And what I realized I needed to do as a new immigrant was absorb Israel into, into me, into my being. And that meant listening to all different parts of the Jewish people. Not only the community or the tribe that I was comfortable with, but really to force myself to understand what they were all saying. And I was working in those years as a journalist, and I had a government press pass. And that was kind of like my passport into the different communities in Israel. I'd be able to go to the peace camp, and the settlers, and the Haredim, and go in and out of all of these different Israels using my press pass under the pretext of being a journalist and reporting about all these different communities. 
but I was really trying to learn and listen. What are they all saying? And what I concluded was that all of these different camps, political, cultural, religious, secular, they all have an insight about who we are as people and where we need to go. And that no one camp was really speaking the full truth about who we are as a people and what our dilemmas are as, as a country. So for example, on the Palestinian issue, I came to the conclusion that the left wing in Israel had been correct all along in warning us about the dangers of occupying another people, another people that did not want to be part of our society, and whom we didn't actually want as part of our society. And I'm speaking, of course, about the Palestinians. And the more I listened to the arguments of the left, the more I realized that the occupation of another people is a long-term disaster for Israel. And that sooner or later, this is going to blow up in our faces. And at the same time, I was listening to the arguments on the right, and I realized that they were right when they were warning about the impossibility <clears throat> or the illusion of making a peace agreement with terrorist groups <clears throat> that don't recognize our right to exist in any borders, even if we were to withdraw from all the territories back to the 67 borders, the war would continue. And we experienced that in 2005, when we withdrew from Gaza, we pulled out the 8,000 settlers who were living in Gaza, a move that I personally deeply supported because I felt enormous relief that we were not occupying a million and a half Palestinians anymore in Gaza. But what we learned in 2005 is that if you pull back to the 1967 line, the rockets will fall over the line. So that the war is not about 1967. It's not about the consequences of 1967, the occupation of the Palestinians. It is ultimately about 1948. And what do I mean by that? That the war is really about 1948. It's about the existence of Israel in any borders. And so I was listening to these arguments for years and saying, well, yeah, you know, the left, they really have a point about occupation. And yeah, well, the right really has a point about the futility or the, the illusions of trying to make peace with a non-existent partner who doesn't recognize your right to exist. So what do we do? I think the first thing that I concluded is that what we need to do is start listening to each other's arguments. The left needs to listen to the warnings of the right, and the right needs to listen to the warnings of the left. And that didn't happen in Israel in those years, because left and right shouted past each other. Today's Israel is much more nuanced. It's much more of a sense of internalizing the arguments of the left and the right, so that most of us today in Israel wouldn't call ourselves left or right, but centrists. Centrists are a little bit left and a little bit right at the same time. We are left in the sense that if we believed that there was really an opportunity for peace, we would be ready to make almost any concessions territorially. Create a Palestinian state, pull out of most of the territories, and, and uh, try to reach a deal. At the same time, centrists in Israel don't believe that at this point, maybe it'll change in the future, but for now, any concessions that we make will not bring us peace. Again, because it's not about territory, it's not about compromise, it's about Israel's existence. So most Israelis today are doves in principle and hawks in practice. We want to be doves, but reality doesn't allow us to. 
One way that I would put it is that for centrists, <coughs> a Palestinian state means two things. We centrists <coughs> have really two nightmares about a Palestinian state. The first nightmare is that there won't be a Palestinian state and we will continue to be occupying other people indefinitely with all the moral difficulties that that involves. And the second nightmare is that there will be a Palestinian state and we will find ourselves under missile attack from the West Bank and not only from Gaza. So Israel today really is in an impossible dilemma. What's playing out today Beyond the missile war that we're seeing on our TVs, in the war in Gaza, there's a much deeper war that's being fought and that your generation is unfortunately going to have to really respond to. <coughs> and that is, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> that is the war that is being fought against the legitimacy of the Jewish story. The right of the Jews to define ourselves as a people, as a nation, to return home after 2,000 years, all of that is under increasing attack. Now, every generation of Jews faces a different challenge. And your generation faces a particularly difficult challenge. And that is to defend the legitimacy of our story, that this is a good story. This is a story that is, I'm, I'm in its essence, an inspiring and meaningful story, and not an evil story, which is what our enemies are trying to portray it as. When anti-Israel demonstrators are marching in the streets with Israeli flags that have swastikas on them, and they're trying to turn us into the new Nazis, that is what I mean about the war, the real war, that we're going to have to fight. Now we have two wars. We have the actual war that we're fighting in Israel, a military war. And we have another war that we're fighting around the world, which is a war for the legitimacy of who we are, our right to define ourselves, and the right to, to be a people. But in order to defend that story, we have to understand what our story means. Who are we? And if you stop and think about it, thank you. If you stop and think about it, our story is really very strange. There is no other story like it in the world. And when the Palestinians and their supporters say, well, who were you to come back to this land after 2,000 years. Nobody's ever done that before. Our answer is, well, that's right. That's true. Nobody ever did do it before, but we managed to do it. And the question that I think we need to ask ourselves is why? Why did we come back? Why did we continue to exist as a people after we lost our land and all other peoples in the ancient world that were in our situation and that lost their land basically disappeared. Why did we continue existing? And so when I say that your generation will have to defend our story, I think the challenge is even deeper than that for you. And that is not just to defend our story, but to really try to come up with some new answers about what this story means. What does it mean that we've come back home? What does it mean that we have lived to see the fulfillment of what for 2,000 years was really a fantasy? It was this messianic illusion that the Jews kept, which was simply an impossibility. How could the Jews ever re return to their land from all over the world and, and recreate the country? What does it mean? What does it mean for you growing up in a really one of the most privileged corners of the diaspora. What does it mean for you, on the one hand, to have this legacy of the Shoah, to come from many of you from families and certainly from the community where the Shoah is so central to, to its identity? So on the one hand, you are 
coming from the most traumatized experience in Jewish history. And on the other hand, in your actual lives today, you are about the least traumatized generation of Jews, probably ever, certainly in the last 2,000 years. You are growing up as the most free, most successful Jews in Jewish history. So what does it mean to live between that tension, that dichotomy of the most traumatized and the least traumatized? And when I ask the question of what does our story mean, and I put to you the challenge that it's your generation that's really going to have to come up with the answers. And the reason I say that is because I have this, this deep and, and <clears throat> really, uh, I'd say, depressing feeling about my generation, which is that whatever answers we've already come up with is pretty much uh, what we have to say. And I think that we, we, we've exhausted our capacity for, for new insights. And I sense in Jewish life today a certain monotony where in my generation we're arguing about the same things, we're discussing the same issues over and over again. There are really no new ideas that are coming out from my generation about who we are and what our story means. And I think it's going to be up to your generation to try to start thinking deeply about what this crazy story means that we've inherited. And does it have, first, the first question is, does this story have meaning? Now, there are many Jews who've concluded that it actually doesn't, and it doesn't need to have meaning, just as the French don't torment themselves, or the Australians don't torment themselves about asking, what does our story mean? We exist because we exist. Many Jews, and certainly many Israelis, would say, well, we exist because we exist. We don't need to think about that. But I, my feeling is that that's a very short-sighted approach. First of all, for practical reasons, because we are the only people in the world today whose story and whose legitimacy is under assault. And so we need to really ask ourselves what our story means. And also because in order to be true to who we are as a people, we need to really think about the fact that we've inherited a story that Jews for, for, for thousands of years believed has deep meaning. If you would have asked Jews at any point in the history of, of our people, really until the 19th century, the beginning of secularism, um, who are we? The answer would have been, we are a people that was, that was appointed by God for a very specific purpose, to bring God's awareness into the world. Now, many Jews today don't really believe that. And I would say most Jews, to, some ex to one extent or another, wonder, is that really true? And if you look at Jewish history, if you look at modern Jewish history, you can really find evidence, if you want, for the existence of God in, in our story and the absence of God. You know, my father, after the Shoah, left religion completely. And he said, God doesn't deserve Jewish prayer. But after the Six Day War, he came back to Judaism and he said, well, now I forgive God. And now I can become a, a religious Jew again. So these are some of the questions, I think, that we need to struggle with as a people, as individual Jews. And what I'll say finally, in conclusion, is that I think that even though you, you live in one of the most remote corners of the diaspora. We also live in a very Jewishly rich corner. And again, don't take for granted how you're growing up and what you have. Because you're, you're being given the tools and the conditions to really think deeply <coughs> about who we are as people. <coughs> and we're going to need answers. And my hope is that the Jewish community in the future that you will join and, and, and reshape will contribute far beyond uh, your numbers, as Australian Jews have over the years, but to really start contributing uh, not only in helping Israel physically and financially,
but also helping the Jewish people grow emotionally, psychologically, and spiritually in really understanding who we are and what our purpose is in the world. So why don't we open for a conversation? Questions or comments? Does anyone have any questions or comments? <coughs> Anyone have any questions on the current situation? Yeah. Can you explain the idea of occupation in Israel today? Of? Occupation. What that means? Yeah, that's a very important question. What does occupation mean? Uh, I personally draw a distinction between occupying uh, the Palestinian people and the question of occupying the land. I don't feel that I'm an occupier in any part of the land of Israel. I believe it is my homeland. Uh, the problem is that this is a homeland that is being claimed by other people. And the tragedy of this conflict is that between the river and the sea, the Jordan River and the Mediterranean Sea, there are two peoples, each of whom is claiming the whole of the land as their own. And in the same way that I believe that all of this land, this small land, belongs to the Jewish people, the Palestinians believe that all of that land belongs to them. And that means that we have one of two choices. We can either continue to kill each other for another hundred years, and whichever side wins, maybe the other side will disappear, be wiped out or expelled, or we can try to, to reach a solution which has been there on the table almost since the beginning of Zionism, going back to, to uh, the early 1930s. And that is the solution of partition. Now, partition means dividing the land, sharing the land. And partition is a very cruel solution. It is not an act of justice. For me to lose part of the land of Israel is an act of deep injustice against Jewish history. As it is on the other side for Palestinians, the notion that they will not be able to have what they call all of Palestine as theirs. And that leaves us with a situation where both sides will feel, in some sense, rightly so, that an act of injustice has been imposed on them. And maybe that's how we'll know that peace is real, if both sides feel that the peace is unjust to their side because it will be unjust. And I see an eventual peace, which God willing will happen in our lifetime. I see an eventual peace as, uh, as being in some way uh, a, a time of mourning rather than celebration. We will be mourning for the lost parts of the land of Israel that we will have to sacrifice. Uh, on the other hand, there will also, I hope, be a component of celebration for the end of the conflict. So when I talk about occupation, the fact that we are occupying the Palestinians, what that means is we are determining that they will not be able to have their own state, they will not be able to exercise their national self-determination. And I have to say that I once felt guilty about that. I was once what one could call a guilty Israeli. And today I don't feel guilty about occupying the Palestinians because we gave them numerous chances in the past to create a two-state solution and Palestinian leaders repeatedly rejected peace. So that's the distinction that I would draw. But that, but that doesn't mean that I'm still not occupying the Palestinians because that is the, the unfortunate reality. Uh, did you all hear the question? The question is about the Haredim. That when I speak about the left and the right, where do the Haredim and their extreme views on Zionism and, yes, anti-Zionism? Most of the Haredi community today is no, no longer anti-Zionist. 
In fact, they haven't been for a long time. I would call them more non-Zionist than anti. Uh, you do have a, a wing of the Haredi world that remains anti-Zionist, Satmar, Ritzuri Karta, uh, in Jerusalem, we call it the Eida Haredit. But uh, for the most part, the Haredi world is, um, I would say, neutral to some extent about Zionism, which I personally find um, very difficult to accept. And I, I don't understand how one can be a believing Jew, uh, as, as the Haredi are, where you believe that God is involved in the smallest details of one's life. If there are coincidences that happen in your life, a Haredi will say, God is, that's, that's from God. Um, and, and yet the return of Jews to the land of Israel from a hundred countries after 2,000 years and our ability to defend ourselves again and learn how to defend ourselves uh, after the Shoah, how the Haredi community could remain religiously neutral toward that, to say, well, we don't know if God is in that or not. So I, I find a deep contradiction in the Haredi worldview. And I would make an exception with Chabad. I think that Israelis do make a very strong exception when we speak about the Haredi world and the very difficult relationship that we still have with the Haredi world uh, and Chabad. Chabad is very much part of the mainstream in Israel. And the other, the other uh, difficulty that we have in Israel with the Haredi world is its refusal to participate in the defense of the country, in the life of the country. And you know, one of, for me, one of the, the, the um, I'd say the most um, magical uh, aspects of life in Israel is seeing Jews from all of these different countries and ethnic backgrounds and, and colors and, uh, starting to marry each other and really creating, again, one people out of a hundred diasporas. The Haredi world is not part of that process. You know, I go to, to weddings that, that more and more frequently you'll see Ashkenazim and, and Mizrahi marrying each other. In the Haredi world, it is, it is Ashkenazim, Haredi marrying Ashkenazim, Sfaradi Haredi marrying Sfaradim, and they're not part of the process of what we call in Israel the gathering the gathering of the Jewish people. And the gathering is not just bringing us back physically to the same place, it's actually turning us into families again that are interconnected. And, and I think that the Haredim are being deprived, are depriving themselves of one of the great experiences of, of, of Jewish experiences of this generation. Uh, the question was, um, how do you, as, as young people, uh, help the situation? Uh, I think the, the, you know, the first, the, this is a community that really excels in activism, in promoting uh, Israel's interests. So I don't feel that I need to tell Australian Jews how to defend Israel because you really, I think, are doing a remarkable job and it's a model for, for other Jewish communities around the world. Uh, I, I would urge you, though, as young people, to really, again, educate yourselves and, and think deeply about the issues. Think deeply about what you're being taught by your teachers. Listen to what's being told and process that for yourselves. You know, and, uh, and be open to other ideas in the Jewish world. And um, I, I would hope that uh, you would form discussion groups. That, that, that aren't necessarily initiated by the school or by your teachers, but really begin to start reading, start, start developing your own ideas about uh, Jewish identity and diaspora, Israel relations, and all of the questions that are on the table. Question. 
question is uh, the growing uh, accusation against Israel as a terrorist country. Uh, is this going to uh, to inform? Is this going to inform world opinion? Is this going to last, or can it change? I think that uh, we're we're in a very volatile situation in the Middle East now, and the images from Gaza are are deeply disturbing, and not all those who are attacking Israel are doing so because of anti-Semitism, some because of ignorance, some because they're truly, truly disturbed at the notion of a powerful army uh, attacking a, seemingly attacking a civilian population, which is not in fact what's happening, but that is the perception. But if you look at what else is happening in the Middle East, uh, a extraordinarily evil uh, forces are rising all around us. Uh, in Syria, you probably have more people being killed in a, in, 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 in a few days than, uh, than have been killed in this entire war in Gaza and uh, what's happening in Iraq, uh, Iran. So I think that, that, that in a way, the, the atrocities that are happening in the Middle East uh, will force at least some people to take a second look and to think, well, is Israel really just acting like an aggressor or is it facing a, a really serious problem? You know, there, there are one of two ways of looking at, at the conflict in Gaza. Either it is all-powerful Israel waging war against the powerless Palestinian people. That's one way to look at this conflict. The other way is that Israel is defending itself against an alliance of extremist Islamist radical forces ranging from Hamas to Hezbollah to, to Al-Qaeda, which is now on Israel's borders, to Iran. And that's the way that almost everyone in Israel today, left, right, and center, views this conflict. And, and I think we need to really make that case. We need to get people to understand that this is not a war against the Palestinian people, a war of aggression against the Palestinians. This is a, a self-defense self war against some of the, the worst political movements on the planet. Yes. Are, are 
just as good as anything that's being created in, in world music. And I would hope that because of your proficiency in Hebrew, you, that would give you uh, access to Israeli music in a way that, that other diaspora Jews your age don't have. And that you really become familiar with names like Mary Sakharov or Ehud Banai or Eviatar Banai and some of Israel's great <laughs> rock bands that are producing world-class Jewish music. And that's, it's, it isn't only Israeli music, because increasingly what's happening in Israeli music is that Israeli rock musicians are rediscovering Judaism, rediscovering Jewish prayer, and are creating this extraordinary body of work that is, is, I think, among the most beautiful Jewish music that's been created in recent generations. And it is virtually unknown in the diaspora. And Israelis take it for granted that you can turn on, you know, Galetzal, turn on Israeli radio, and, uh, and you'll hear uh, our leading rock musicians singing the prayer poems of Yehuda Halevi, or Ibn Firol, the medieval Spanish Jewish poets. That's now become part of Israeli culture. But that music doesn't only belong to me as an Israeli, it belongs to you as diaspora Jews. And so the, the, these, these great works that are being created in Israeli music could really be a common language between uh, Australian Hebrew-speaking Jews and young Israelis. And uh, that's something that I would really urge you to, to look into. And, and uh, one, one, of, one of my frustrations, I, I do a lot of speaking and lecturing in the American Jewish community, where I'm from. And I've been trying to bring Israeli rock music to young American Jews, and they just don't have the Hebrew. They don't really have the access. So I, I really hope that that will happen here. Thank you for the question. Last, last question. Obviously, we're going to cross a lot of Nazi social media. I think it's important that we engage in these posts and offer a different perspective of the agenda. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. You know, the, um, the war to defend Israel now has so many fronts. You know, it, it, used, it used to be relatively straightforward. We had uh, the print media and electronic media. But now there's, it's, it's so multifaceted. And it also, I think, gives us a, a great opportunity to really be out there. And I think some terrific work is being done in, in social media by Jews around the world, uh, by the IDF. I think the IDF's level of, of fighting back in the social media this, in this war has been very impressive uh, as opposed to other wars. So please, please keep doing that. And uh, it was really a pleasure to meet you guys. Thank you very much. There's, sorry, Mrs. Khan was my teacher, and she's just overruled me with one more question. So, uh, one more. so last question. <laughs> Where, where's the question coming from? Uh, Say it again. Who is winning the current war? Uh, right now, I, it looks to me like a, a bizarre kind of draw where, where neither side is, is winning. Um, I don't think we, we can really tell yet. Look, we, don't, we still don't know how deeply we've set Hamas back militarily. We don't know how deeply Hamas has set us back in terms of our position around the world. And we also, there's another factor here, which is we don't know how this war will impact on the Palestinians in Gaza. We're hearing different reports. They're the Palestinians of the West Bank are apparently are becoming more pro-Hamas because Hamas is fighting Israel. But that may not be the case in Gaza. Gaza Palestinians are looking at the devastation that Hamas has brought on them and, are, and, and hopefully will be asking themselves, why do we need Hamas? 
So we could have a very strange situation in which Palestinians in the West Bank become more pro-Hamas because they didn't experience the war or the consequences of Hamas. And on the other hand, we could see Palestinians in Gaza revolting against Hamas. It's a very, very strange moment. We, I guess the final answer to, to, that, to that question uh, will be determined by how this war ends and uh, when the ceasefire is imposed. And we certainly can't let Hamas declare victory because that will only empower the radical forces in the Middle East. But how we prevent the perception of victory really will depend on uh, how, um, how this war ends. So, thank you. So, thank you very much. Um, thank you very much for taking the time. As I said at the beginning, um, you didn't just hear a different approach, which we do get to hear from most speakers. You actually hear different approaches. And I think even different approaches on the same, you know, the same questions, different approaches to them. And I think that, as I said at the beginning, that is one of the unique abilities of our special speaker. So thank you again to um, Dr. Hilton Himmerman, thank you to Ms. Miller, thank you to the um, to Shalom College. Um, and what I would say is that um, not only did we hear many approaches, we also heard some existential questions. Counterpoint is coming up, um, then Ellil is coming up. We find ourselves amidst this war. And I ask you guys to walk back with these questions. This Sunday, it's going to be announced this afternoon. This Sunday, there's going to be a very special rally. The last few rallies we had were in this auditorium or in Central Synagogue. This rally is going to be out in a park, probably in Barraclough Park, this Sunday at 10.30 a.m., which is the park next to Bunei Kiva. So um, we're going to be announcing that later, but we definitely encourage everyone that wants to come show a voice. Obviously, there'll be a lot of protection from CSG, etc., but we encourage you to come out and be proud. Um, but we also encourage you to keep asking these questions, keep engaging in this dialogue, and continue the conversation on the way back to period one. Thank you very much. Thank you.